my name is Bob Cervelli. I'm going to be the kind of the MC for the workshop. Um, I live in St. Margaret's Bay along with most of the other transitioners in uh, Transition Bay St. Margaret's. We've got two presenters today, um, two households, long deep experience in livestock of different kinds. They're going to be presenting each for maybe about 20, 30, 35 minutes. We'll do a short Q&A after the first one. Um, but keep most of it um, up for discussion at the end of the second presentation um, so we can have a good thorough discussion. There'll also be a short presentation up at the end on the changing landscape uh, with regulations and zoning, particularly in HRM. Um, so a little bit about, about that. Uh, we are going to try to end promptly around 4.30, uh, give or take. Um, so we'll try to stick to that timeline. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, we've got 17 people on Zoom and as we expect more will be joining in and uh, Mel uh, Mulrooney will be reporting on how many are connecting in on Facebook. Uh, this is being recorded as well just so that everyone knows. Um, and I should say that at the beginning if you want to get on our mailing list or if you want to make a donation Go to our website, transitionbay.ca, pretty simple, transitionbay.ca, and everything's right there. There's a button for donating and a button to get on our mailing list, so you can keep track of all the stuff that we're doing, uh, not just the rest of the spring, but as we get into next fall. Um, so that's what we're all about. Um, what I would like to do first, uh, before we get into the presentations, is just give a quick five-minute background on Transition Bay and the transition movement internationally. And what I would like to do is, I think to start out, I'm going to share my screen. And I found this slide. I trust you can see that. Transition Bay. The next 10 years will be completely unlike the last 10 years. That slide was one of the very first presentations we did when we formed the organization um, almost nine years ago now. That was the very first one, the thought for the day, we pulled down off the International Transition Movement website. Um, the International Transition Movement started in 2005 it was based on the idea of building local resilience at the local community level um, and um, having people and communities being better buffered against significant global changes, particularly around economy, energy, and the environment. Well, here we are experiencing about as significant of a global change as you could possibly imagine. Um, so I wanted to put this up, thought for the day, um, and this comes right out of the kind of, I think the thought process of the whole transition movement is governments are fine, but they tend to be a little behind the curve. Individuals, a huge amount going on, but if we act individually, uh, it's really probably not enough for an impact. And the real power is at the community level. So that's our message. That's what we've been doing um, for those eight, nine years doing various types of community projects, building resiliency. So that's really all I wanted to say um, by way of an introduction. And feel free to go to our website, explore um, a lot of who we are, what we do, and so on. And I think you'll find a lot of really good, valuable information there. So I think um, on that note, what I'd like to do is introduce our first speaker. Uh, Charlotte Mendel. Uh, Charlotte is an author. She's a part-time teacher at Dalhousie University. She lives in Enfield with thousands of bees, eight chickens, three goats, three sheep, two cats, two children, and one husband. <laughs> Eli Elias is the husband and he is also the beekeeper. So we're about to learn a whole lot about how they've managed all this livestock. So with that, I would like to turn it over to you, Charlotte, to uh, uh, tell us what you've been doing. 
Hello. So um, my name is Charlotte and I'm going to be your presenter for today. Um, of course, when we decided to do this presentation, it was, you know, as Bob said, it, it, Transition Bay is about creating viable, strong communities. It was pre-COVID-19. Um, but currently, you know, the price of um, goats has apparently shot up. It's uh, apparently difficult to even get hens because everybody's sort of realizing, wow, when something, when, you know, when the shit hits a fan, uh, you know, our, our money and our entire economy is, is based on money, is completely useless. If you can't buy the resources that you need um, with the money that you have, then what, what, what use is money? So people are really interested in the idea of, you know, how to be sustainable. And at the beginning of the COVID, uh, you know, my children sort of said to me, what if we run out of, what if we run out of food? And I sort of said, you know, what if there's a food shortage? And personally, I don't think there's going to be any type of significant food shortage anytime soon. Uh, but I could answer them and say, you know, we might be limited in our repertoire. We're used to eating whatever we like, but we will never run out of food because we have a guaranteed supply of eggs and cheese and meat and milk and, and honey and in the, in the, in the summer vegetables. Um, so, you know, this is, everybody's saying this is unprecedented. Well, we know that we're heading towards ecological uncertainty and and that the you know the waters are rising we and that that's going to create food scarcity and water scarcity in the future so the idea of you know uh having a community and from what i understand of uh, you know Mark, say Margaret, but you are a very strong community that, uh, that some people do some things um and other people do others because you know i know that you have other presentations on you know planting trees you don't want to plant a whole bunch of fruit trees and have goats because the two won't go together but if you have one somebody in the community doing one thing and somebody in the community doing another thing, then um, then basically you're you're uh, you're um, you're a sustainable community. Whatever happens to you, so. Um, uh, I'm going to show you, I'm not, the, the focus today is not on exactly what you need and exactly how to do it. It's more a, a kind of like a teaser, like, would this be of interest to you? Because there's certain things that, um, you know, that, 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 that this will, will appeal to some people more than others. So I'm going to share my screen now because I've made a PowerPoint uh, and then I'm going to go through the PowerPoint together with you. Um, okay, so hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is, this is my first, uh, why isn't it going up? Okay, there we go. Okay, so those are, these are my goats. This was taken, I, I think, probably a couple of years ago, but the black goat there in the middle with the huge udder is called Lila. You're going to see her as we go along. Um, and just behind her, the smaller whitish goat, that's Stella. Those are my two main goats. I always have two main goats and one main sheep, and from them come, uh, offspring every year. So the benefits of getting livestock, okay? So we've just discussed uh, food security in an increasingly, un, uh, you know, uh, uncertain world. You, it, you, you know you've got, you've got this food and that we know also in Nova Scotia that there are lots of, um, you know, all the farmers produce hay. The hay is like, you know, that, that's not gonna be a, at risk probably, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, when other food supplies are at risk. And many farmers in, in Nova Scotia also produce their own grain. They don't export it, but obviously if there was an issue with imports and then that that could grow very easily uh, and also you don't need you know for many young animals maybe when they're pregnant um, and they're you know they're, they're, there's times when you can support with grain but hay is the main uh, the main uh, source so you're pretty secure with animals you've got your you know you've got your food um, your animals are happy. My animals live in, live in, in, a, in a spacious enclosure, which you'll see later on. They have these lovely lives. They go for walks every day. Um, and at the end, it is true that it's not my favorite day, butchering day. Every, you know, we have a, a cycle every year whereby the female does get pregnant. We send them to the buck or, or the ram or the buck or ram come here. Um, and then we try to stagger it so we have milk all year round. And if they have male babies, we, tend, we eat them. Um, but I go with them to the butcher and I'm there the whole time. They know me, they feel happy. There's not an instant of, of fear or anticipation or anything. There's just death, you know, the, the, the butcher holds a gun and an animal is dead without knowing for a second that that's what's going to happen. So I, with, originally I really hated that day. Now it's just like not my favorite day, but it's, it's fine. It's, it's not a bad death. Um, inflation free, you know, they have their own animals. Uh, it's not going to go up in price. Um, 
the lifestyle that you have when you have animals is very healthy. I am outside for at least an hour every day. Um, I, you do have to be a reasonably, uh, you know, you, you have to lug, apart from the fact that the goats are always trying to trip you up because they're rather annoying animals, you also have to lug heavy feed bags, you have to lug water, you, you know, you're, you're outside, you're physically working, um, and being outside, I think, is really, really important for human beings. We don't do it enough. Often in Nova Scotia, of course, I feel this insane desire not to stay by the fire when it's a horrible winter day or there's a storm but um of course i have to go out and when i do i always feel better coming back a greater appreciation for that warm hearth um, than i had before i went out it's environmentally good i used to eat i love passionately red meat um uh, especially with t-bone steaks probably my favorite uh food and i um i I have cut down probably from two to three times a week to two to three times a year to eat uh, beef just as a special treat. Um, and the, the, the animal that I butchered allows me to eat red meat maybe three or four times a month. Um, and so for a family of four, three or four times a month. So essentially I am not, I'm eating massively less red meat and, and goats are less impactful on the environment than, a lot less impactful on the environment than, um, than uh, cows. So, and of course with the bees, of course, they, they provide most of our, their pollination uh, it results in something insane number, like 80% of the food that we eat comes from, you know, is, 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 is guessable through the pollination of bees. Um, and ironically, our pesticides to preserve these crops in perfection are killing the bees. Um, if you keep the bees, you are reversing uh, the, the, you know, the detrimental effects of our, uh, of our pesticides. Um, the food, for whatever reason, I've never quite worked this out, is massively nicer than what you buy in the store. I don't know if it's because it's younger uh, or if it's because it's um, happier and doesn't feel that the fear coursing through an animal in most slaughterhouses, does that impact the food? I don't know. Um, certainly, all of you, many of you will know that when you pluck a, a tomato from your garden or buy it in the store and taste them one after the other, there's no comparison. It's really the same with the meat um, and the eggs. Uh, not so much the chicken meat, because the chicken meat, uh, they run around a lot and that gets them a little tough. Um, but other, every, other, every other source of food is, is really delicious and fresh. So there are drawbacks as well. And for me, the biggest drawback is less freedom. I can't travel. I can't pop off to a retreat uh, for a couple of days when I'm feeling stressed. I have to do a whole bunch of organizing in order for that to happen. You don't want, I mean, you're always sort of calculating. You don't want your cost to be much more than your, um, your output to be more than your input. So I try to keep, I try to, you know, reduce uh, you know, visits to the vet, and that kind of ties in with the second bullet. Um, we, there are a lot of health issues in death, but also I don't want to pay a whole whack of money for somebody to look after my animals. So I've kind of worked with neighbors' kids, and just this year I found somebody who um, who is willing to do it. Because really, it's an hour a day, and I want to pay minimum wage. I want to pay ten dollars a day, even if I have seven or eight animals. So from one side, it looks like what? That's a, that's nothing uh, for somebody to look after seven or eight animals, but on the other, that's what you're looking for to make it viable financially. Um, and equally, you want to reduce uh, visits to the vet. So we do have health issues like Lila, the black doe that you saw in the first um, in the first screen. She's heavily pregnant now, um, and she always gets mastitis. So the last time, it, and, and it's like she's the most benevolent, sweet goat until she gets mastitis, and then she's just like she goes berserk every time you have to put the ointment. The treatment in her teeth she just goes crazy kicks and, and it's, it's 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 a nightmare so i said this time okay don't be so stingy you're going to take her to the vet you're going to work out some type of deal that he can put it in um three or four of the times uh for lesser than 65 dollars a pop um which is what a, what a vet costs uh, last time i was there um and there's no vets right now so that's hanging over me that stress of what's going to happen and how will i do this by myself um, during this time. So, uh, but there's also lots of death, like we've had uh, hawks, um, foxes, raccoons especially, with, and everything has killed our chickens at one time or another. Um, the lamb that you see in the bottom right corner there, the mother, she, actually that picture was just taken a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, she had her two little babies, which you'll see in a video later on, uh, much bigger now. Um, her mother died suddenly after two weeks. Um, uh, after two weeks after giving birth and I still don't know why I think it was probably she had them late in the season and she was hot uh, you know 
heat stroke or something. I don't know. It was very odd. But again, I had to, those, that was like incredibly intensive, uh, labor intensive because I had to feed the animals three or four times a day or whatever it was um, uh, for a long time. So th that's, that's, that's definitely a detriment, especially if you're not a very relaxed person. If you're slightly nervous, um, then, uh, then the, the issues, health issues and death is, 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 a, is, a, is a negative. Um, and the third one, I just added that this morning. It's funny, uh, but my nails, I have, I have, I, I have farmer's hands. I have scratches all over my hands. My, my, I have no nails to speak of. I have calluses, um, you know, that, you know, you are, you are working in your hands. Um, if you, if you, if you like the way that you look and it's really, really important, um, that would be a negative as well. Okay. So this is a little video, half an acre is all you need. I don't know how much you have or people have in general in, in Margaret's Bay, but uh, yeah. It's about half an acre. You can see the bees over in the right hand side of the screen. Chickens underneath. That's our garden that supplies us with Tomatoes, herbs, onions, cucumbers, lettuce, everything you need for salad. In the background there, you can see the goat, the goat shelter. Um, we'll, we'll, I, we have it in the woods, and we'll go closer to that later on. And this is the, the shed that came with the house. Standard shed. That's all you need. Half an acre. Okay, hey, so that was that is all you need. You can see that it's not a huge property. Um, I don't know if you, we're going to revisit the bee place and, and, and everything like that. Uh, and I just wanted to show you the garden uh, in the summertime because, of course, I took that video last week in preparation for this presentation. That's what the garden normally looks like. And that was that was my, that were my those were my children playing in the house uh, practicing. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, we're going to meet the hens now. Oh no, beginner's guide to hens. So I'm not going to, again, I don't, this course is not in order to, this presentation is not to give you every single bit of information you need to start tomorrow. It's to, it's to you know, sort of provide you with the basic in case you, you know, in case there's interest. There's so much information online, um, so many people doing it in Nova Scotia, especially hens, but also goats and sheep. Uh, once you actually start to do it, you'll dig down into the absolute uh, uh, facts and the nitty gritty. Um, so just really briefly, and also these slides are all going to be available to you afterwards on the Transition Bay Facebook page uh, if you want to look at them more at your leisure um, and there's going to be a question period after the presentation too um, but three or four hens will give you tons more than you need eggs for one family a family of four um, and still it costs us 300 you're going to see um, uh, the, what, the little tiny coop that we did inside our already existing shed later on um, it wouldn't have cost us more than 50 bucks so that, that's kind of like you know, more or less, um, a simple coop, you only need laying boxes and a roost, um, four hens and chicken feed. Hens used to cost five to $10 per hen, chicken feed's about $17 a bag. And again, with goats and sheep, there's lots of local suppliers. Uh, you must start with two, both in hens and in goats, sheep, it does tend to multiply the numbers, but you, 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 they're not, they're herd animals. They, they won't be happy if there's just one of them. Um, and again, you need, you need some type of shelter. That shelter you saw in the woods is 10 months of the year they're there. I only bring them into the barn when it's really, really cold outside, um, but you do need uh, some type of shelter. And uh, yeah, these are just some images of potential simple sheds uh, that, one can, that one can construct. So this is our garden. It's about. It's about. It's a, it's a shed. It was here when we when we bought the place. It's about to either twelve by twelve or fourteen by fourteen. This is we, we put in the divider. This is where the hay is, the milking stand, um, and you know you always have to look for the various places for the for the hens. They lay their eggs in various places, and also on the side is the um, these are the that was a feed. This is the milk that I milked this morning. We get about a liter and a half a day. Um, and, goes. and on this other side is where the animals go when they're like, giving birth or uh, when it's really cold, like mine, mine is 10 or below. Um, originally, we just had this for the chickens. Um, and so you can see that, uh, inside there we have our little um, sticks where they can roost in the nighttime. And this is where they were supposed to lay their eggs. So they usually lay it over on that side. This is all we had in the beginning. And now we've, we've opened it up and they go off there to eat. So really very simple. You need a roost. Um, if you have goats, you need something to hold the hay just for waste and the water. Um, 
Yeah, very simple. Okay, and now we're going to meet uh, my hens. Come on your farm, you start with three or four chickens, which is all you need if you want uh, enough eggs for yourself, three or four chickens, but kinda, it kind of grows. Okay, so... <laughs> These are my chickens. <laughs> I used to give them names, but now they're collectively known as the Henny Pennies. And so I have nine females here. Uh, they always go broody. Um, you know, several of them, this is, a mo this is Miss Muffet. She's the most uh, broody. She's also my oldest hen. She'll go broody every year. She rears uh, in several broods. So when the broody is sticking, um, most of the time she's going to have a rooster in there. Um, and so he'll uh, create uh, the next generation. And, and when they get broody, you stick their fertilized eggs underneath them. And they, if they're good mothers, they'll sit there patiently for three weeks. So the hens have got to be the easiest animal in the world. Basically, you give them feed and water, you hang it up in, in, in the morning, you, you let them out. You do need to shut them up at night. You need a place to shut them up because they're very vulnerable to predators, as I mentioned before. Um, and that's all you need to do. You, you know, you can go away. Anybody, any child uh, could look after uh, uh, the chickens because you, again, it's just twice. You take it away in the, the feed and water in the nighttime and you give it in the morning. Um, and they give you a present every day. They can get very friendly. They can follow you around. They can, you know, they, they, they can be quite affectionate. Um, and, they, and again, they give you this little eggy every day. Uh, they're the easiest animals. Um, some people love their roosters. Um, when you have a good rooster, he's going to protect them against predators. And as I, as I said before, there are so many predators uh, for chickens. Um, and he's, if he's a good rooster, he'll, he'll sacrifice himself uh, fighting a fox or, or a raccoon or what have you. Um, and he'll also, like, he'll be, they're, they're kind. They'll go and they know that the hen wants to lay their eggs in a quiet little place. They'll go into the coop and they'll find a little hay spot in the corner for her and call her over. Or he'll find a worm. He'll always give it to the, his, his hens when he finds something nice to eat instead of eating it himself. Um, but I don't, I always eat my roosters every year, whether they're nice or not. There's just an element of, I, I can't quite put my finger on why, an element of violence. You saw Miss Muffet in the, in the previous uh, video, um, the black hen, she's very old. In, 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 except for with roosters, the most dominant, there's a strict hierarchy with chickens, and the most dominant are usually the oldest, which is as it should be, really. Uh, they're the wisest, uh, the most experienced. Um, and to see her sort of, uh, you know, the rooster, these little tiny chicks growing up very quickly and then suddenly challenging her and attacking her and, uh, you know, ultimately pinning her down <laughs> um, to mount her. It, 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 I can't quite explain it. There's more squawking of a, of a frightened, nervous nature in the yard when there's a rooster. Um, so we, we eat them uh, once a year. Okay, let us meet the goats and the sheep. Come on then. Hello, Lammy. Hello, Justice. Hi, Lila. Hello, Stella. Hi, Shoshi. So, uh, we, I have an agreement with my uh, husband that I'm supposed to only have two animals. Um, so you can see that there's more than that, but the fact is, is that when you have, it's got like one animal, that was six years ago, so the sheep was a new addition, but really I only have three, but every year they have babies, the babies stay with them for several months, um, and the babies stay with them for several months, so you usually, the, most of the year you have quite a lot more than your, your three based animals. So this Shoshi, she's, a, she's what was a Stella's baby, which is as big as Stella now, she still eats from her. Uh, last year, and now this this gentleman is visiting us, and he's because I don't keep a bus. Males are a little bit more problematic, and um, and he's going to be supposed to be making uh, Stella pregnant. So hopefully, he'll be doing his job. Okay, so, and my and my animals are very much like pets. For example, they can do they can do tricks. Shake, Lila. Thank you, Lila. Very good girl. You don't want that? Oh, sorry. Um, she'll, she'll go like that if I ask her too much. If, and she loves me. Do you love me? Do you love me? Oh, she goes, oh. Yes, I love you. I love you. Stella, come here. Come here, Stella. I think you can have some just previously for Justice. Justice doesn't know any tricks because he's not mine. Come here. <laughs> oh, oh, good girl. That's another trick. You're supposed to wait till I tell you, though, Shashi. It's your body hair before you go to go. The one of the reasons I don't like... 
males is a little bit more aggressive than Stella. Stella, come here. Come here, Stella. Good job. Dance. Dance, Stella. Dance. <laughs> She's a bit pathetic, but okay. What's, what's Stella? What's, what's Stella? Come on, what's Stella? She, she, she. Come on. Good girl, Sashi. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> okay, so that's the goats and sheep. So a day with the goats, they're a little bit more labor intensive than the hens. Uh, they need feed and water and hay morning and night. Uh, but mostly it's the milking, uh, the milking, you know, you're doing it while they're eating. So you, you saw the milk stand in the slide with my, uh, the inside of my barn. So she sits there, you capture her head, you give her food. Um, and then you milk her, it's probably about 10 or 15 minutes. So it's not that labor intensive, even so. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's the structure of the breeding so that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're calculating when to take it to the, to the, to the ram or the buck. Um, and of course the babies come uh, and you, uh, it's that sometimes is a little bit more labor intensive, especially when you want the milk, you have to separate the, them during the night, the mother and the, ba and the baby during the night uh, after, after the first few weeks. Um, you also are looking after, you know, any health issues, you're pairing their feet, their hooves, you're pairing their hooves, um, but there's not, it's not that labor intensive. Um, and I just have a little funny thing here, why goats get a bad rap. It's always been interesting to me. I don't know, in the Bible, uh, in, when Jesus was born in that barn, I think there's no goats, there's just lambs. Lambs are, are so sweet and lovely and children are compared to them. And goats, all of the metaphors and similes are all negative, like uh, as stubborn as a goat, or he's an old goat, which means he's randy. But actually, I can assure you that the male goats are no more horny than any of the other male animals, are all very, very horny. Um, so I don't know why they get a bad rap, but I can say that they're not, they are, they're, there's something about their natures which is rather stubborn or irritating. It's not like a dog. Like they don't want to please you, they want the food. And if you're stacking wood or doing something with them around, and it sounds like it's fun to have animals around, a dog might help you and bring you a piece of wood. A goat will jump onto the wheelbarrow and topple it or jump right onto the stack where you're doing it. So if there's something in their nature which is, which is irritating, but but awfully sweet animals. We're going to move on to the bees now. Um, I, I'm cognizant of the time, and I was strictly told not to not to go over 35 minutes. So I'm going again. This is a lot of information, and I'm going to. I, the idea being that if you're interested, then you dig deeper. Like this is the sort of overall what you might expect in terms of time investment and money investment, bee wise um, and livestock wise, uh, and, and what you need. Um, so Albert Einstein said there'd be no more man if there were no more bees. Um, I'm not, not sure if that's so, but certainly there'd be a lot less food. Um, so the bee colony is made up of a queen and tens of, tens of thousands of female foragers and nursing bees and hundreds of drones, male bees. Um, these, uh, uh, these, uh, I initially, when we first got the bees, I wasn't really that interested in them, but they are fascinating. There's something very fascinating about them. They work incredibly hard. They're very industrious. They have a really clearly delineated roles. Everybody knows what they need to do. Um, and, uh, you know, the drones, the male bees in, 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 in the fall when they've done their job, the female foragers and nursing bees will drag them outside. I've seen that process happening, dragging them outside because it's time for them to bugger off and, and die because it's, um, because it's going to be cold very soon. Um, they just, and they do little dances when they, got it, when they find a nectar supply to tell the rest of them where, where to find the nectar supply. They're geog geographically pinpointing the area by their dance. They're just really interesting animals or insects. The process, you're going to see in the video about the bees, you know, all of those um, slides with all of the honey combs stuck to them. And the process, of course, when it comes time to harvest the honey is to extract these slides. Are they called slides? Frames. Frames. To extract the frames, um, to scrape off the honey, and then to strain it. Um, and my husband, who is the beekeeper, will be available for any uh, more uh, in-depth questions about that process. And again, I'm not going to go into all of what you need to do to become a beekeeper, because if you're interested, then you'll be interested in that information. And if you just kind of like want to know a bit about it, then you don't want to go into too much detail. But essentially, it does, it is slightly, seems to me to be slightly more um, uh, sophisticated or, or 
you know, you need to you need to brush up on how to do it either through books or lots of lots of information on the internet, um, or consider taking a course. And you also need a beekeeper permit. Um, and there's some suppliers in Nova Scotia, but lots of Canada. And all of this stuff that's in the startup costs around thousand dollars. All of that, you'll see my husband using it, both the hive sets, the smoker, the gloves and the jacket. You'll see all of that in the video. Um, and there's certain tasks, you can see them here, divided by uh, season. So in the spring, you'll see the video that was taken last week where, we're in, where my husband's inspecting the hive and, and feeding them if necessary, if, if not in our case last week. And splitting it because when the hive, when there's too many, they'll, they'll a group of them will detach with 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 one of the queens and go elsewhere. So if you want to prevent that happening, you can split the hive yourself and give them a new hive to live. Um, and that's the spring. And in the summer, you're inspecting it for mites, etc. And you're towards the end of the summer, you harvest the honey. Um, and in, in, and in the fall, you're you're kind of reducing the hive entrance because you want you want them to keep safe throughout the very cold winters. Um, and you begin to feed the bees once the flowering pants have disappeared. And in the winter, it's mostly monitoring, make sure, making sure that the openings don't get covered by snow. Um, this is much less labor intensive than the other animals that you've seen in this presentation. Um, we're talking like a few times a, a month. So this is a very easy um, insect to keep uh, or hobby or, or um, way to contribute to your community. Uh, it's a very easy way to do it in terms of your time investment. Uh, it's the first uh, check of the season. We're going to check the hive. We have one hive surviving that survived the winter. Uh, so we're going to have a look, see what's going on, if they have enough food, if they don't have enough food. I smoked them a little bit uh, before we started. You can see here if you uh, zoom in and come. You can see that I fed them with last year's honey and some uh, wax. So now I'm going to open up the, the hive. Why are you opening up the hive? To inspect it. To inspect it for what type of things? But to see how much food do they have, how ma what are the numbers, is it healthy, and get it ready for, for a split. So uh, if to prevent it from swarming, I'm just going to check that uh, it's uh, lively uh, and there's a, a lot of bees in there. And if there are a lot of bees in there, next week when the weather is nice, we're going to split and we're going to create another hive. It's going to be a little bit messy. There's going to be many bees here. Ooh, look at that. So you see it, there's some capped brood here. So you see these capped cells are cells where bees are basically uh, uh, or larva uh, uh, exists and then uh, a bee is going to hatch uh, out from it. I'm going to just see if there are any eggs. Yeah, there are eggs here, which means the queen is laying eggs. Very nice. I guess. Okay, so um, now we're going to open it up for questions, if there are any questions about that presentation. Charlotte, thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think what we want to do is maybe five minutes of questions at this time, and we're going to save the rest for the end. Um, so please, um, anyone. Um, I think what we can do is unmute everybody. Um, and uh, if you do have a question, feel free. We do have uh, uh, maybe 10, 15, could be up to 20 people on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, and they'll be typing in questions and, and Mel will be relaying that as well along the way. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, jump in. Well, when you unmute people, you get a lot of funny noises. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I think you should mute iPhone 2, whoever that is. <laughs> We'll mute some of that. I do have a question, um, uh, Charlotte, for both of you. That bee video, we have one beehive here ourselves. Was that taken this spring, just a little while ago? Yes, a couple of, uh, last week. Okay, so the queen was already on it then, laying eggs, and you had some cap root already. Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, the, this colony basically was started uh, last summer. So we had three. We lost all three, and I started from a, a new nucleus colony uh, last year. So what you see here, it's a uh, high, basically fully ready. I mean, the, the queen is laying, so it's, it's going to probably swarm at the end of April if we want to split it. So full function. Wow. Okay. So they're on it pretty early then already. Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay, Cam here. I've got a question. What do you need to do in order to fence the goats in? What sort of material do you use and how high need it be? You more that. Turn your audio on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, I think some people are saying, some people. Okay, so, uh, so uh, we use the five foot uh, uh, mesh fence, basically. To just surround the uh, the enclosure, and we basically uh, attached it to the trees uh, surrounding an arbitrary area in the woods. Uh, some people would say that you need uh, even a higher fence because uh, goats would uh, you know skip that. But we found that you know they're pretty. That it keeps them in. The only thing is when they have thorns, they tend to find ways to sort of crawl under or go in between. And sometimes we find that they find places. Uh, to escape, and but we then block them. They are Houdinis. I mean, they are very clever at escaping. So we, we have some of them. I mean, it is true that five feet. Some of them can jump over that, but they're not. We, they've got a, a, over half an acre there. They don't have any real reason uh, to jump out. And also, if some of them are very clever, get jumping out. The others aren't, and they don't like to be separated. So we had a little lamb just recently who kept on trying to get out, and then he'd spend the whole day yowling, ah, 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 like completely ignore him, bugger him, and then he soon learned that that wasn't a good idea um, to, to get out. So, you know, we, did, we used trees, but when I used to, I grew up with horses, and we used to dig, I think we used to dig like a foot or two uh, um, down, it must have been two feet, um, put the post in, uh, put rocks there and fill it up so it's very solid and that's how we would create the posts in order to attach the wires which you would attach obviously with a hammer and uh, those little <laughs> hooks whatever um, so you know if you don't have a, a wooded area but they are very happy in the wooded area they like to chew all the barks and you know piss off all the trees but yeah they are uh, we don't have any problems with them getting away of uh, some people have real issues with it and it's a, a, another detriment uh, but we haven't. And I think if they have a reasonable sized enclosure um, and there's several of them, then it, is, it doesn't really, it's not really a problem. Great, thank you. I have a question for the beekeeper. Yeah. Um, so we, we have bees, we're in St. Margaret's Bay and uh, we had a swarm in probably the, the middle of July. We caught it three times, um, yeah. but we, Obviously, we may not have got the queen. Um, so, but on the fourth try, we had all kind of, I'd been out, Karen was out. We came back thinking we might get it again and it was completely gone. So we, they were raising, there was definitely queen cells in the old hive, but we lost that hive this winter. So um, would it be because it just wasn't strong enough to survive? Did, did you treat for mites? No. No, and I'll tell you that there, there was honey. There's no question. I, I just went in about a month ago and, and there was honey um, and they were dead, but they were dead. And, and it looked like the hive was quite small. Uh, even when I went in after winter, maybe this, the hive was smaller than I thought. Um, so anyways, any thoughts? Well, it happened to me as well. Same, same situation happened to me as well. Okay. Uh, so lots of food. It doesn't look like anything is wrong. And I decided after a few years to not treat at all, to try to go, you know, na totally natural. Yes. And what I understand and this experience of other people as well is that it's, if you don't check for mites, it's usually, in, if, and you don't treat, after three years, you had a good run of it, the mites get the better of the bees. Yeah. 
So that's why you'll have a lot of food, you have everything in there. Okay. So, so I mean, I, now what I'm doing is I treated them in the fall and every fall, some people do spring and fall, but I, okay. I'll treat once and I'll see how long, I mean, they survive. So treat in the fall for Varroa mites specifically. Yes. And then, and then people are saying that, that's your, your ticket. If they survive the winter, if there are no other causes, then it should be okay. Yeah, and because we've always had quite, quite yeah. good luck, so that's and we we have treated and, and in the we've past. Treated before. Okay, yeah. so yeah. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's probably it. Yeah, we love our bees too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe one more question at this time. Anyone? All right, what I would like to do is turn it over to our next um, speakers. Um, and I'd like to do a little bit of introduction there. Uh, Karen Llewellyn, uh, you're on now, and Claudie Levy, who is just speaking. Uh, they are living and gardening on Todd's Island, uh, close to St. Margaret's Bay, for 30 years. They've enjoyed creating a little suburban homestead. Claudie's retired from HRM, currently owns a small gardening business here in the Bay. Karen works as a counseling therapist in a private practice and also creates fused glass art and original paintings. They are both very involved with the St. Margaret's Bay Gardening Club, which I understand is one of the more vibrant clubs in the province. Thank you. Um, and we're members of a small team that wanted to bring CD Saturday Day to the Bay but unfortunately the event was canceled due to the pandemic and they're gonna be bringing it back next year. They share their home with four cats, a rescued pooch and the occasional house chicken. <laughs> so, okay, over to the both of you. Okay. Um, I have never done this before on Zoom. I hope I don't lose my whole presentation when I go to share the screen, but um, I'm gonna try. See. And okay, I think looks good. I think I have it. We shall see if I lose it. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on keeping chickens in the backyard. Thanks, Bob, for your lovely introduction. Claudia and I are happy to be here with everyone on Zoom and on Facebook today. We've always been interested in creating a little suburban homestead and we enjoy growing a large portion of our own vegetables and keeping bees as well as chickens. There are lots of reasons to keep a flock of chickens and these days with more focus on food production, many of us are looking at ways to eat more locally and increase our own food security. Keeping backyard chickens can be fun and entertaining, but on a more practical side, it can also provide you with delicious and nutritious eggs, great compost materials for your garden, and if you're so inclined, the best free range meat around. They also make great subjects for art pictures, and ours have found our way in, their way into many, many paintings. Whatever your motivation, it's a fun hobby, often delivering some unexpected twists and a lot of laughs. My family actually has rural roots and I grew up around my uncle's farm in PEI. Claudia and I have always gravitated towards having a more rural lifestyle and we began keeping chickens almost 30 years ago. We were encouraged by friends who owned a small bird farm here in Tantalan called the Coo and Cackle. They had fancy pheasants and peacocks, a wide variety of chickens, ducks and geese all living together quite harmoniously. And we already had a small coop because we had some pigeons, some Birmingham rollers and tipplers. So we decided why not add some chickens. We've never looked back. Over the years, our numbers have fluctuated, but we generally have between 20 and 30 birds in our year round flock of laying hens and roosters. Although you don't need to have a rooster to get eggs, if you're free ranging your birds, roosters do provide your hens with some added security. They tend to watch for any kind of danger in the yard, predators, whatever, and they will call the hens to safety if need be. And as Charlotte already mentioned, a good rooster will actually defend his hens by fighting whatever might be trying to get them. 
At times, we've had a few too many roosters, though, when we've purchased what we thought were young pullets from other backyard enthusiasts, only to find out as they matured that they were, in fact, not hens. Um, when you introduce them young to your flock, they usually get along and don't squabble too much, but we don't tend to want to keep more than two, which is currently what we have. For the past two years, we've also been raising broilers or little meat chickens during the spring and autumn month. At the chick stage, they are really no different to raise than any other any other lane bird chicks, but as they mature, their care becomes more critical. They are very susceptible to heat, and because they grow and put on weight so quickly, they have a tendency to get too heavy and go off their legs, which leaves them unable to walk properly, so they can't feed or take care of themselves. It's important to keep them moving in their coop, so to keep, so to keep their legs strong. To accomplish this, we place their food at one end of the barn and their water at the other. And that makes them have to walk back and forth several times a day, if nothing else, to eat. And they love to eat. The other thing that we do is we give them a little safe space outdoors in the chicken yard. We cordon it off from the other birds so they don't get bullied because they are still babies. And because they're so large, they don't move very fast. We encourage them, they're quite tame, we encourage them to go outdoors, kind of get in there with them and move them around, get them moving. We've learned that raising them in the heat of the summer is too stressful for them though, which is why we only get the chicks in the spring and fall now. They need access to fresh water at all times. All birds do actually, but for meat birds it's really critical and their kidneys can shut down very quickly, especially in the really hot weather if they don't have a lot of fresh water. We generally raise our meat chicks for about nine or 10 weeks, at which point they dress out to between five and seven pounds. Some people raise them a little longer, but the larger they get, the more danger there is of them developing problems and being rejected at the processing plant by the inspector. We take ours to Kogamagun processing in the valley um, a poultry processing plant because we appreciate their willingness to work with small backyard producers like ourselves and they treat the birds very humanely. We have a small operation and because we hand raise most of our birds from day old chicks, they become very tame. They actually make great pets and they come to know their human flock members quite well. As you can see, they even like to come in the house at times. They also tend to get to know your habits and they seem to know when you're carrying treats for them. They recognize Tupperware containers. When you're out in the garden, if your birds are free ranging, they are often beside you. They like nothing better than seeing you dig in the garden because that often means that you're going to turn up some bugs or grubs for them. Sometimes it's quite difficult to get things done in the yard because it seems like every time you turn around, you're tripping over a hen as illustrated by this short video. Okay, this is our beautiful chicken compost that we use for our gardens. And this is our new compost bins. And they love turning. Yes, when you're turning over soil, they think there's going to be bugs. Lots of so, they're fun to work in the yard with. And this was a very big pile in the fall and we let them add it and they actually worked it all down they are the best composters they worked it all down to this beautiful and now we're going to start again that we will be actually putting into our garden we have to put into our garden this is the end and of this it. is just remnants from the winter yeah which that's once we figured all the good stuff we'll start we'll be put in putting that into the bin so they're great pets. They're good composters. And they earn their keep. They earn their keep by eggs, yeah. enjoyment, and companionship. And, and we learn lots from them. <laughs> In this next video, you can see Claudie finishing the compost pile with lots more help from the girls. Hello everyone, as you saw in the previous video, we were 
cleaning up the compost and uh, using it in our gardens. And now we are actually starting the whole process of composting again. So we will put the fresh stuff in there, we'll turn to there and turn to there, and uh, the cycle continues. We've gotten chickens from many different sources over the years, and we've learned a couple of hard lessons in the process. Typically, we order day-old chicks from reputable suppliers like Valley Field Farms in Sockville or the Scotian Gold locations in the Valley. They are available in the spring at preset times and literally, develop, literally delivered within 24 hours of their hatching. They come in bulk shipments to the farm and co-op supply stores. You arrive with your little container, pick up your birds and take them home. This is the safest way to start a backyard flock as the birds are generally vaccinated against most diseases that affect chickens while they're still in the hatchery. It allows you opportunity to raise them from the very start as well and develop a bond with them. Plus they're pretty sweet and fun to work with. Sometimes chickens are available from other backyard chicken enthusiasts because they're needing to rehome their flocks or they have too many birds and need to sell a few. If you know the person and you trust how the birds have been raised and cared for, and you feel relatively sure that they're healthy, then by all means go for it. However, if the birds do not seem healthy or the operation doesn't seem like it's maintaining any good sanitation or health, or, um, set health standards, and if you have no reference on the sellers, I would steer clear of purchasing birds from them. There are some diseases in chickens that can be passed on from infected birds to your flock, like Merrick's disease and coccidiosis, as well as some parasites. These are very difficult to treat and you don't want to introduce them to your flock. If you're starting with day old chicks, you'll need a brooder set up. We start ours off in a brooder box pictured here outside at the moment. We keep it in our workshop in our home when we have chicks though. I prefer to have them in the house for the first three or four weeks because it's easier to check on the birds and ensure that the brooder is maintaining good temperatures. Also, I really enjoy playing with them and I like to get them tame. During the first week of the baby chicks lives, the brooder temperature needs to be 95 degrees. Without a mother hen to sit on them and keep them warm, it's up to you to keep the temperature in the brooder consistent for them. Every week after that, the temperature can be lowered about five degrees. Our brooder is made of wood and completely covered in chicken wire because we need the added security for the chicks living with four felines who love to hunt. You can see Ollie is perched on the pen right now and if there was chicks inside, he would be very happy. Some people simply convert a cardboard box into a brooder though. A Google search will reveal many different designs and from very, very, very simple, all you need really is warmth, security, light, bedding, food, and water. Those are the necessary ingredients, whatever style of brooder you choose. For convenience, I set our brooder box on top of a drafting table so that it is, it is at waist height so I can work easily inside it. In the middle of the box, I suspend the brooder lamp I place a chick size waterer and a dish for their chick starter feed. For bedding, we generally use prepackaged wood chips. We also have used straw or hay in the past. Main thing to watch out for is that the chicks can get traction so they don't slip a lot and develop a condition called splay leg. It's necessary to keep the brooder box very clean and I find with shavings that's really easy to do. I also keep a large thermometer on the floor in the brooder box. I keep it underneath the lamp so I can quickly check to see what the temperature is. But a quick way to figure out if the birds are, are um, at the right temperature though is just to watch their behavior. If while they're awake you look in and they're all huddled together under the light, not moving around very much, they're probably too cold. If you look in and your little birds are scattered to all four corners of the box avoiding the light, they're probably too warm. When they're not sleeping, you should see them running around, darting between their food and water like little bumblebees. They're very quick and they're very active. When they get sleepy, which is often, they'll gravitate back to under the light. And they often lie together in a bit of a heap and fall asleep. Baby chicks often lie quite flat when they're sleeping as well. The first year we had chicks, we snuck out one morning, lifted the blanket and peeked in only to see all of our baby chicks lying motionless and flat on the bottom of the brooder box. We were 
absolutely convinced they were all dead and my heart sank and then all of a sudden they started moving and we realized they were only asleep. Apparently, if they're going to be under the mother hen, they have to flatten themselves out to do that. So I guess it makes sense, but it was rather, uh, rather difficult to see them all lying there looking very dead. In the, in the brooder, I use a regular halogen bulb to generate the heat I need. I usually start out with a 60 or 100 watt bulb and I adjust the height that the brooder lamp is off the bottom, off the floor, so that I can get the heat that I want. I want it to be above the little chick's head, but close enough to generate the warmth. To minimize drafts, I also cover the box with an old sheet or blanket. This not only keeps the heat in, but it also keeps the feather dust down, which can be quite considerable. I've never actually used a heat lamp bulb in the baby brooder because it would generate too much heat in that small of a space. However, in the main coop in the winter, I have used a heat lamp bulb in the lamp fixture to give the old birds like Percy, our old rooster here, a bit of warmth and also to help the, um, the water to, to not freeze. I think this winter we used a 75 watt heat lamp bulb and at one point even a 150 watt bulb um, and the, the old guys seem to enjoy it a lot and a few of the old ones ended up sleeping in the straw on the floor under the under the brooder lamp under the heat lamp all winter so I guess they were pretty happy. It's a lot of fun to start out with baby chicks and they become very tame and enjoy interacting with you. When you first get them and bring them home and put them in the box it's good to show them where the water is. I just take gently hold each one and dip their little beaks in the water till they take a drink. Once they're all safely introduced and they've all had their first drink, then I take my hand, take it over to where the feed is and make like a pecking motion with my finger, kind of mimicking a mother hen pecking at the feed with her beak. And all the little chicks will run over and discover the feed and start eating themselves. They're very self-sufficient once they get going. They start out on a special feed called Chick Starter, which you get from the feed store when you pick them up. And when they're a couple months of age, we graduate them to a chick grower formula. Um, once they start to feather out a little bit, like the chickens in this picture, they can maintain their body temperature a little better. So we, may, we move them to the main barn with the rest of the flock. I like to still keep them separated from the larger birds for the first little bit though. Um, and the meat birds I keep separated the entire time. I hang the brooder lamp in the barn as well to give them a little extra heat at night. Um, but I find that having the birds together in the barn where they can all see each other makes the final introduction go a little bit more smoothly. The older birds get used to the sights, sounds, and smells of the younger birds. And by the time I let them all together, there's usually very little problem with them getting bullied because they've already accepted them. The term pecking order is a very real phenomenon in the backyard flock and the babies are at the very bottom of it. By the time the baby chicks are about a half to three quarters of their adult size and able to fly and run, I put them all together. And at this time, they don't need a supplemental heat source anymore. As most of you have probably seen in magazines and online, there are many different coop designs. You can convert an old outbuilding into a functional coop, build something entirely new from scratch, or even order something pre-made from the internet. The aesthetic is entirely up to your personal taste. What is necessary in a coop is protection from predators, protection from the elements, especially drafts and dampness, enough room so that the birds are not overcrowded, and places to nest and lay eggs, and places to roost at night. Coops need good ventilation, as their feathers produce a lot of dust and dander, but the birds should not be in a draft when roosting overnight. Ideally, the bedding should be kept as clean and dry as possible. As a rule of thumb, smaller birds need about two square feet of coop space, while regular sized chickens need about four. This includes the roosts and shelves, basically any surface that the birds can walk or perch on. The outdoor run, technically they need about double that amount of space. Lots of surfaces count as roosts when it comes to birds. They like to roost high, unless of course they're old and they're under a heat lamp all winter but they love to explore every nook and cranny of their coop. Lighter body birds are usually very adept at short flights in the coop and they can get pretty much anywhere to roost. We have a small overhead light that we leave on, but it's not necessary to do this. 
we have a lot of birds and I feel that having a supplemental light in the coop at night helps them move around if they want to reposition themselves or if they find themselves in a draft. It also allows them to eat and drink overnight as we leave food and water for them all the time. In the winter, I use a 40 watt halogen bulb in the overhead light as it creates a little bit of heat near the roosting area. Um, but in the, in the summer months, I switch to an energy efficient one. Our birds do lay eggs all year round, but production falls off over the winter and twice a year when the birds are molting or growing new feathers, they also stop laying eggs. Young laying birds will generally lay an egg a day, five or six days a week. As they get older, they will continue to lay, but production will fall off. Day old chicks purchased in June will begin laying in the fall at about six months of age. They're fussy about where they lay their eggs, so we offer several options. We have high nest boxes, we have milk crates on the floor, and as you can see, some make their own nests in the straw in little out of the way places. They generally like quiet spots out of the main traffic flow. Because we have roosters, our eggs are fertile, which means that if we allowed a broody hen to incubate them, we would have baby chicks. We collect the day eggs every day though, getting enough for our own use as well as a few dozen to sell to neighbors and friends. They're delicious and because they're not incubated, they are no different in looks or taste from the unfertilized eggs. This time of year, our birds are free ranging in the yard with us. Uh, at least when we're home, which of course is all the time right now. They love to eat bugs and dig around, but as things start to grow in our gardens, we'll want to close them up in the chicken yard. The scratching and digging can destroy a lot of new plants. So it's getting to be that time when we're gonna get the fences back up and corral them back in. They're great to put in an area that you want dug up though. You can actually put a little bit of plastic fencing around an area with a lot of weeds, add a few chickens, bit of food, encourage them to stay for a few hours and see what they can do. I'll give you a little example of that. With our current setup, we also have an outdoor pen that is fairly predator proof that we can use for the birds if need be, like if we're away for the day or if we won't be back in time to shut them up properly at dark or if we notice that anything has been lurking around like foxes, mink or weasel, we will use this pen as opposed to allowing them in the chicken yard. The pen gets a lot of full sun during the daytime, but there's also shade available closer to the barn. Chickens love dusting in the dirt in the sun and that's how they keep their feathers clean, but they do need the availability of shade on hot days. The outdoor pen has logs around the perimeter to discourage anything from digging in. We've clad it in half inch hardware cloth and there's also wire on the roof to prevent hawks and eagles from swooping in. The whole thing sits on a bed of gravel and because we are, don't want anything to be able to dig through. We're always looking for signs of predators trying to get into our coop and regularly do perimeter checks around the barn and outdoor areas. And unfortunately, we quite often find signs of things trying to chew their way in or dig their way in. So we have to stay on it. Chicken wire is great to keep your chickens in, but if you have a problem with predators, keep in mind that raccoons can actually chew through chicken wire. That's why we use hardware cloth on the predator proof outdoor run. In general, if you use it on the bottom three feet of any fencing or exposed coop area, you should be in pretty good shape. As you can see by the top picture, some of our visitors in the chicken yard are more e interested in eating the chicken's food than the chickens. And this deer was a frequent visitor last summer um, jump the fence, no problem. Chickens would all stand around and watch him as he ate all their food. In our regular chicken yard where they spend most of their time, we simply use chicken wire to prevent foxes, dogs, and other daytime predators from simply running in and snagging a bird. Raccoons and mink are usually only a problem after dark. And so far, we've been very lucky not to have eagles or hawks actually come into the chicken yard and take anything. Again, when they're out in the yard or especially when they're free ranging, we're generally around or only off the property for short periods, so they're relatively safe. Wherever they are roaming during the day though, they never wander too far away from their coop. 
and as it gets dark, they always return home to roost. Hence the saying, they always come home to roost, because they do. From a safety standpoint, the most critical time of the day is always at dusk, when more predators are likely to be lurking around. So we're always very careful to make sure we are home in time to get the birds safely back in the barn, ensure they're all in, and close the door. If you're raising hens for eggs, you will need to feed them a good laying feed, which is available from all farm and feed supply stores. It comes either as a mixture of whole grains, like this picture, or in pelletized form or as crumbles. These are all balanced feeds to ensure proper levels of nutrients that are optimal for egg production. All of our adult birds eat this food, whether they are hens, roosters, or birds that are no longer laying. We also supplement with corn and scratch thrown into the chicken yard as treats. They do love treats. They will gleefully gobble up anything you want to give them, and chickens can eat almost anything as they are omnivores, meaning they like meat as well as veggies and grain. There are some foods to avoid, and I will provide a link to this as a resource. This winter, I started growing barley seed in tubs for them to have as greens. It was really easy to do, and they loved it. I will also make instructions for this available to anyone who's interested. They love digging around in any plant materials you want to get rid of from the garden. We regularly throw armfuls of weeds and spent vegetables into the pan for them to scratch around in. Anything they don't want to eat, they look for bugs, scratch through, then it goes into the compost pile when they're done with it. We regularly go through leftovers in the refrigerator as well, finding wonderful treats for them, which is why they all recognize Tupperware. You will see in this next video, they like bread, but we're careful not to give them too much of it as it can lead to problems like sauerkraut. They're so tame. They're such a pleasure to have in the yard where you're working. <laughs> Everybody's got their own chicken call. Wow. Hi, girls and boys. I just took them down to big water, Karen. Come on, come on. <laughs> We've enjoyed having a wide variety of chicken breeds over the years and like anyone we have our favorites. We love the little brown layers and we always get a few of those each year but we also enjoy the heritage breeds like the Bard and Columbian Rocks, Polish, Arcana, Rhode Island Reds and the Little Silkies to name a few. There's lots of good information online about breeds, but it's hard to go wrong with these guys. Chickens are pretty resilient little creatures and they're pretty healthy most of the time, but they do get sick, especially in the colder and damper months or as they age. Sometimes we'll notice that a bird's not doing very well or not acting normally and we'll keep our eye on it. I usually will add stress aid powder to the water in the coop. This is a vitamin and enzyme formula that you can buy from the feed supply stores. I actually always put it in the baby chicks water as well when they're in the brooder as the stress from shipping is really hard on them. If I discover a bird's not doing very well at all and needs more help, I'll bring it into the house. I usually put them in a cat or dog kennel depending on how much room they need and bed them down on chips or straw with food and water. We'll place the little cage near the wood stove in our TV room. A sick bird needs to be warm in order to have the energy to fight whatever's making them sick. Depending on what I think the problem is, I may add tetracycline to their water as well as stress aid. I'll often con consult with other chicken people or I'll go on Poultry Atlantic Facebook site to post questions about what's happening. If I'm having a real problem with a bird that's not old and should otherwise be healthy, I may call our vet or a rural veterinary service. Most of them are happy to talk to you over the phone and answer questions, um, and we've had very good luck with that. We have a few old birds that have lived out their final days in the house. As you can see by this photo, even fashioned a diaper for one out of a dust mask so she could wander around downstairs and visit. It wasn't an N95. <laughs> no. She was too old and too weak to go back in the coop as it was winter, so Rosie spent her last four months as a house pet. 
When she was mobile, she graduated from the dog kennel to a larger pen on the floor of our workshop with lots of bedding, and then she free ranged downstairs in the TV room when we were home. In this next video, Rosie's in the kitchen getting a treat. Hey, chicken. I don't eat Kentucky yucky. Here we go. Hey, I'm the head roof. Where's my? <laughs> oh, where's mine? <laughs> you don't need to be jealous of the chicken. As you can see, Rosie had a pretty good life at the end. We have had quite a few chicken visitors inside and we've gotten quite attached to every one of them. Chickens are very sociable and they don't like to be alone. In the coop, they need other birds as companions and when they're in the house, they make friends with our cats, our dog, and they hang out with us until they can join their feathered companions in the coop again. In closing, we hope you have enjoyed our little presentation on keeping chickens. There's lots of good information available online when it comes to raising poultry and we'll provide a resource page with some of our favorite links. And I guess we can open it up now for questions. And if anybody has anything like to ask or comment on, please feel free and thank you very much. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. And how do I stop sharing my screen? <laughs> <sighs> I have a question about starting your chickens. You said the first three to four weeks you keep them inside. Um, do you keep them inside like a, is a shed good enough or do you keep them inside a heated garage? What do you do there? Um, I put the brooder pen right in the house because it's easier, it's easier to keep, um, it's easier to keep track of them. If you had a heated shed or um, if you had a heated garage, the main thing is being able to keep the temperature inside the brooder at 95 degrees. So you can put it anywhere you want as long as you have the ability to do that and the electricity and you know all that kind of stuff. But I find in the house you, have, you don't have to worry as much about drafts and in the house the temperature is going to be a little warmer than it is outside, especially if you're getting your chicks early May um, or in the fall, um, like, like the meat birds. Um, and also, I find if, if they're, I would worry if they're in an outbuilding, if the power went out or, you know, you've gone to bed, you're not likely to know if there's any problem. So I just find it safer the first three or four weeks. Once they're about four weeks old, they go outside um, and they go into the main barn. And as I said, I keep them separated until everybody gets used to them and it's, they're big enough to sort of fend for themselves and until they can run fast and then I can introduce them. But um, yeah, the main thing is you can put your brooder box anywhere you want um, as long as you can guarantee that you can maintain the temperature inside and keep it draft free. And Natalie, our workshop is almost just like a, it was an old, it was an old kind of garage area. So it's, but it's in the house, but it's in the house. But you know, you would know if the power went out that you would probably have to do something else. Um, and uh, yeah. so I think things can work. You just have to keep safety and electricity in mind. Yeah. Okay. So keeping them inside in the house for the first uh, four weeks and uh, I'm brand new to chickens and I plan to only keep me to chickens and I'm on a new property. So I don't even have a shed yet. So everything for the chickens will be from scratch. What do you recommend putting them out into after that? Like something built small, like a, a coop. Cause what I find online is all for um, chickens that people plan on keeping for eggs. Um, I'll tell you what we did, and I don't know if this is happening again, but um, we had an old coop that was actually needed to be taken down. And so I actually called the community college because they have a carpentry program. And usually, now it's probably not gonna happen this time of year because of COVID-19, but normally this time of year, um, the students would be working on different types of sheds. And uh, they were very reasonable. I think it was probably an eight by 12. And uh, you, I think there were $800 and then a little bit of uh, money to actually have it shipped. Um, so that was, you know, a really, 
um, quick way to get a, you know, something that was really quite, you know, good price and well built. Um, I think with meat birds, um, because they're not, you know, doing a lot of flying and don't need to roost in the same way, I think you could actually go with something much smaller. The main thing, they, they wouldn't need a lot of headspace because they don't fly. Um, it's more enough headspace, enough room so that you can get in and look after them. Um, I would definitely go with the um, dimensions, like two square feet per bird kind of thing, and give them a little bit of a fenced off outdoor space so they can get some fresh air and sunshine. It has to be predator proof. And you have to ensure that they're not damp or in a draft overnight. Those are kind of the main things. And again, with the meat birds, you're, you're only keeping them until they're, you know, maximum 12 weeks of age. Um, they're a big, fat little bird at that point, but they don't fly and they don't move around a whole lot. So you don't need a huge, big coop like you would for um, birds that are flying and wanting to go up high to roost at night. Natalie, where do you live? Um, I just live outside of Porter's Lake. Okay. Um, well, you're more than welcome. We could give you our phone number. And oh, fantastic. You, and um, 902. Oh, just let me go grab a pen. Hang yeah. on one sec. Um, one second here. While I grab that pen, I have one more question about what to bring them out into next. So these pictures of chicken tractors that I see are not what I would put them out into first. No, I think you would need a little bit of a, a little bit more of a secured building, but I don't think you would need something as big. You know, you saw the greenhouse on our, um, on our, on, on our barn. That's where we raise our meat birds. Okay. And so what we're going to do this year is we're actually going to create a little house within that structure. So it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be high, but I would say that you do want to be able to kind of secure them. Um, at night, just for the sake that you don't want a predator to get in. Sure. And I've got a pen here if you want to give me your number. I know too. So just a second, um, Claudia, I just want to make a point to say that this is also on Facebook and the video oh. will be public for people to come back to. Yes. So I just wanted to give you a heads up about that before you say out your number, if that matters. But so I, if you want to, you can give it to Natalie in chat, unless you don't care who sees give it. Give it to Natalie in chat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, the chicken tractors are great for getting chickens, um, any chickens, meat birds or laying birds out into different areas of your yard where they can kind of, you know, free range on the yard a little bit and dig around, but they're not safe for overnight and they're not usually um, very predator proof because they don't usually have very good bottom and they're usually like chicken wire and so I, you do need something to pen them up at night. Jakey. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so Natalie, we'll give you our phone number on the chat thing if I can figure out how to do that. Jakey. That's great. And I think uh, we've got a question with, uh, from Denise. Hi, my, my question, I have, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I have uh, young chicks that are two weeks old. They're in a Rubbermaid bin in my living room with a heating lamp and they're all set up and I sleep on the couch to keep an eye on them because I've become a mother hen. <laughs> Um, my question is, uh, they keep pu pushing their water, like I'm having a hard time keeping their water clean. Uh, and I don't know if there's tricks to keeping the water, you know, I keep changing it, but there might, I'm sure there's an easier way of doing it than what I'm doing. Currently, I have one of those little chick things and I've tried suspending it, they knock it, like I just can't seem to keep the water right. So it's a little chick water and a little white thing with the red thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I. What I do is I set the whole thing inside the bottom, um, you know, the, the saucers that you put uh, pots in, clay, yes. clay, like a clay saucer. So I have one with the lip of it, it's fairly deep and the whole chicken water sits right inside it. Right. Um, and it helps to keep some of the chips and everything out. And I, right. and I also prop, put it up on like a block because they're big enough at two weeks to right so, so you could put like a couple bricks or something underneath to get the whole thing up off the bedding right and okay. then set the little water inside a clay um pot saucer 
which mm -hmm. will help to keep it upright as well. Um, and it, the one I have is just a wee bit bigger than the actual tray of the water. And that seems to work. And I, and I have to change, I change it out twice a day. Like they'll fill it in the morning, fill it at night. They'll get right. They okay, kick that sounds good. Day. I'm doing it like five times a day right now because they, I go over and they've got it completely destroyed. <laughs> so it's between me and the chickens trying to keep the water clean and organized. And I know, so right now what I have done is I turned the, the saucer, the, the pot sauce are upside down right hung the water thing from the roof cage thing i got on the roof but there's still like it's become a real challenge so yeah anyways so there must be some innovative piece uh and i will try this the setting you it in the saucer and then setting it inside something they can't knock it over as easily if it's inside the clay pot they can't knock the whole thing over right because when they knock it over then i have to change the whole bedding yeah yeah. right because it's wet so like we're playing this game and i keep thinking this is what my chicken life is going to be like <laughs> going forward i'm going to have to create some innovative ways of outsmarting them or i i, I don't they're know. having fun with you <laughs> they are having a lot of fun in fact i've wondered if they're doing it for attention sometimes right <laughs> <Very social. laughs> so thank you i'll try the pot thank you very much okay I've got a question as well for um, all three of you, um, Charlotte, Claudie, uh, Karen. How many chickens have you lost along the way due to predators? Oh, oh lots. <laughs> lots, okay. Lots. Um, well, not really. We've been pretty, Karen, we've been pretty lucky. We had a raccoon get in and eat one. We had, uh, that was a while back. Yeah. We've had, um, when, free ranged a couple disappeared like in the woods like kind of never came home um and we had a mink literally get into our coop last some no two summers ago got into the greenhouse part where we we're keeping the meat birds and they were about a week away from taking them for uh, processing so they were a pretty good size and i saw this commotion it was like nine o'clock in the morning i saw this commotion in the greenhouse and meat birds don't fly, they don't move around that much. So to see all these white things popping all over the place through the windows, I thought, whoa, something's going on down there. And I went down and a mink had gotten in through an old rat tunnel, I guess, uh, gotten into the greenhouse because we didn't have hardware cloth on the floor at the time. And um, he had killed two birds in like three minutes flat, I think, and was ready to go after some more. And I drove him out. He actually came back while I was there and tried to get back in. And the only thing I had with me was a cup of coffee, which I launched at him and he left after that. <laughs> anyway, he did get two birds and we had to do a lot of work to that coop. But um, yeah, we've, we're very aware of them. We have fox on the island. Um, so one summer we couldn't free range at all. And um, we, there's been sightings. I think they're around. We haven't actually seen any in our yard. So we're just, we're always watching. And we're always looking for holes of things trying to chew in and dig in and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I guess we haven't had a lot. It's just each one's very traumatic. Charlotte, what about you? Oh, okay. Hang on here. Um, ah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, good. Sorry, I was looking for how to how to send a chat to everyone that I'm on mute, but I couldn't I couldn't figure it out technologically above my head. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we have, we've had, uh, we've had a few, well, you get clever as time goes on. We've had hawks, uh, we've had some very dramatic, I have a party here every um, spring for my kids go to, to go to a camp in the summertime. So every spring I have a, a party and invite all the kids here and they get very, they're all city kids and they get very excited because they think, oh, you know, any time something happens to them. So the, the, the one time when they came, we've had a death by hawk if you have a death by a hawk, they come back every day. Um, so you have to keep your chickens in for four or five days and that kind of solves it because they go off to pastures new. But at the time I let them out because I knew there was gonna be a whack of kids running around my lawn. I thought my chickens are gonna be safe from any bloody hawks. Didn't it catch a morning dove above their heads? This hawk swooped down, grabbed out of the air a morning dove, and all of the feathers rained down on our heads. It was like, it was really exciting. And the next, next year, my cat caught a squirrel while they were here. So death, as I said, is really part of the farm experience. We had, we had used to keep um, a lot of pigeons, fancy pigeons, 
when we first started the whole chicken thing and over the years a hawk picked off every single one of them so we no longer keep pigeons because we we did lose all of them to uh to actually to a pigeon hawk when we saw him in action every several days so yeah they do come back once they have a good hunt for sure and i i've i've seen lots of piles of feathers which used to be pigeon so i know what that looks like <laughs> Um, I had a question about rats, if I may ask. Um, you were just mentioning rat tunnels and watching the videos and what you guys were showing, um, where we are, we have a huge rat problem in this area, mm -hmm. um, we're in the city in Halifax. And uh, I'm always wondering if like, if we had chickens, um, how would we protect our neighbors and us from just being overrun with rats? Well, my father, had a, my father who was now passed, had a, had a wonderful saying. Um, you're never 20 feet away from a rat. And he actually had a little pest, a little, uh, he did pest control on the side. Um, and there's no question, I think there's rats everywhere. And we try to get really like, we try to kind of clean up the feed. Um, actually, I've got our feed in the garage as opposed to in, in the chicken coop. Um, and I think, you know, when you start to see them, um, that's probably when you have an infestation because very rarely do we see them. Um, and I must admit the mink out here have kind of probably taken care of them at, at different points in time. Um, it, it definitely is a concern and some people are more, um, have more of a phobia about it than other people. Um, we've not seen them do, they seem to coexist with our chickens, not necessarily our baby chicks. We've never had anything happen, but, um, it, it's a real hard one. Um, and in Halifax, where I grew up, I mean, I think, you know, there would be lots of rats around and it, it definitely is a food source. And my understanding is they tend to stay very close um, to your food sources. So if you can really um, be mindful of that, that may be, may be helpful. Yeah. Um, it's the grain. They, they're not really going after the chickens. They're going after the grain. Yeah. You, with the goats, if you have other animals as well, you can't really um, ensure that there's no feed because it kind of spills out the sides yeah. of the mouth yeah. or whatever. I mean, if you if you have a good tomcat, he'll go after a cat. We have traps all the way around. We, you know, we have, we just we, we we've had rats. Um, I, I used to live and let live because I don't you know I, I, that was my that was my premise. But yeah. like, until they went underneath the mother and grabbed a live chicken, pulled it out two or three nights in a row. And I was thinking, I didn't even know it was a rat initially, but they were, they were completely closed in the coops very, but the rats are very clever about climbing up. They can climb up walls, they can get in. And then I, 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 I launched a war, um, poison all over the place, traps all over the place. And they, I did, I did, and my cat locked in there every night. Uh, so I, I kind of, I, 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 I think it's under control now, but it, it is an issue. They won't hurt your adult hens. Uh, they won't hurt your, um, your, I mean, your, your bigger animals, but they do, they will grab a, a live chicken, drag it out there. They're nasty to see as well. Yeah. One of the things, um, uh, Tara and Sebastian, do you have chickens now? Uh, not currently, no. So you're thinking about getting chickens? Yes. So one, one, one tip that I would give you, which, I, which a friend of ours who actually grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan, when you're building your chicken coop, if you can put tin down on your floor uh, in, the and corners. in the corners and kind of, because they don't like tin, they can't get through tin. And, and so again, it, I'm starting to do that myself when I'm actually, you know, working on the coop, I'm actually laying a new floor. So if you could find some tin, even go to a salvage yard, um, that seems to work really well because they will, they, their teeth are very strong and they will eventually work through wood. Um, yeah. There's no question. So, but, uh, but it has to be along cloth. an edge. Yeah. They get through hardware cloth too? No, they won't get through hardware cloth. No, you can no. use that as well. But if you could find some old tin and also oh, do a little bit of combination of both, um, um, especially you, where you're, build, you're building new, it's a great opportunity to think about yeah. that. Yeah, if you can keep rats out of your coop, then your feed and everything will be safe and your birds will be closed up at night. You probably won't be adding too much to the rat problem in the city. Um, I mean, people that have bird feeders, people that have compost, I mean, all those things are attracting rats. So you're, you're not, you know, if, you're, if you can keep your coop from 
anything getting in, then you're not kind of adding to the problem, I don't think, with, with the feed or anything for your chickens, because it's all in the barn. Just don't feed them in the yard like we do. And if they, no. my, my understanding is if they don't have a, a food source, you, they're not going to be there. It's no. all about food. Yeah, now John Wimberly is on the line. Um, he lives in Halifax. I know he's kept chickens for a number of years. In his chat, in the chat box, he said uh, he can speak to rats in the city. So, John, are you on? Yep. Hi, Bob. Great. Good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. Um, yeah. The the simplest solution that I've found uh, is that if you can if you can build your coop on a flat surface. Um, it's fairly straightforward to lay down um, basically a floor of hardware cloth. Um, if you want to attach hardware cloth together, um, I recommend something called hog ring pliers. Lee Valley used to sell them. Other places probably do as well, but a great way to just attach hardware cloth consistently together. But basically making a, just a sheet of hardware cloth that you would put your shed or other sort of coop onto um, mm -hmm. and then combine that with the walls, uh, the, the walls of your run or of your coop, if you have hardware cloth going up, even just a few inches, that then curls down out and attaches to that bottom sheet. And again, that's not something that's meticulously threaded. If you've got hog ring pliers, you just kind of attach one of these little hog ring pliers, it connects. And doing that makes like basically a perfect seal. And so um, I've had kind of three different uh, coop situations um, God, I guess the kind of the interim ones, maybe more in the city. And uh, I've had rats, rat issues or whatever, rat uh, neighbors in all of them except for one. And that was the one time that I um, properly did this on a flat surface and had a nice consistent uh, bed. And that worked just perfectly. Great. That's good. Okay. So hardware cloths where it's at and you really got to make sure it ties together. Uh, at the edges with other sheets of hardware cloth, it sounds like. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So what might be good, uh, David, I think you've got something that you can add on um, zoning, bylaws, that sort of thing. I, yes, I can. Might be a good time to jump in. Uh, gladly. So I'm going to do this shift to screen share and I will show you a, uh, a, a set of, of, of sites where you can go to and find uh, information that you need to know about zoning. Now, uh, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in each one of these because there's so much detail about it but I will start to say that Halifax is under the process of, of making all of the bylaws allow chickens in limited numbers uh, anywhere in the Halifax municipality. And it's underway so that they're considering allowing everyone, wherever you are, to have um, a maximum of 10 birds in a backyard coop only, not front yard, no roosters, and you have to have a fenced run. Uh, it's still under consideration, it's not enacted. They would start it with the, um, uh, what's called the, the Halifax plan, or the center plan, mm -hmm. and then expand out from that over time. So uh, the document that, uh, do you all, I hope, do you all see this document? Yes. 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 Great. Uh, fantastic. So you'll see at the top uh, the URL, which uh, you can then uh, go back to after we're done and pull this uh, recording of this up and copy the URL down. And I'll also try to make a document that I can post at the Facebook page uh, and elsewhere with the, the, uh, the URLs for this. So, uh, so this is the, um, uh, the, the first one. Oh my goodness, and that drop down menu keeps on coming back, trying to cover up what I'm trying to get to. But you will put this on our Facebook page? Yes, I, I will, the URLs. Okay. And this, this second page is, that I just showed is part of the 
Same thing, it basically shows later on that it has a study. It says specifically prohibited uh, places, Dartmouth, Sackville Drive, uh, Silent on use or Bedford, the Halifax Peninsula, Halifax mainland. Or basically you can, uh, you can do any amount of chickens you want um, uh, just because they didn't include chickens specifically one or the other. And um, my son has been a, a leader in making sure that they admit that that is the case rather than not. Um, and they have another area, it's only permitted where agricultural uses are permitted. Um, and uh, so if you want to know what your specifically place is, you can go to the very back of the document. It has an attachment that is part of the PDF. When you go to the same URL, you'll see displayed there. And you'll see here, I've got that shown up for the planning districts one and three, St. Margaret's Bay. Uh, the plan area, zones that permit chickens, and the lot area requirements. Uh, that's right now. And you'll see that there's just a few areas, you know, the mixed use and mixed residential uh, that allow it, even out here, which, uh, and all these other places, which it doesn't allow. Uh, so uh, to follow up on that, you can, you can look up these different spots and see where you actually are and what it all means, but you can go to this document that's displayed here now. Uh, and, but, uh, but to find out, to match the information on those documents to your specific spot, go to the document there and uh, that's displayed here. Remember, I'll be posting these all up now. And then you would click on what area you are in. And I've already clicked on the planning districts one and three plan area, which is St. Margaret's Bay. And then if you follow that down, you can see that uh, here is a map of the uh, future uh, land use map where they're planning to go to. And here is an interactive map that shows all of of a Halifax municipality. And, if, and here you go down to the St. Margaret's area or wherever you live and just click on that area. And you can either add in your address and the little thing that popped up, or you can go and just uh, uh, keep on zooming in and clicking on this and go down and, uh, and you have to move it over. Um, it's not, Anyway, it will move over. And then you can keep on going down and down until you find where you want to, to go. And then you can, you can actually look at your very own lot with a little bit of fussing and see exactly what the zoning is. And the zonings were changed for almost everybody since Halifax went to uh, being part of a greater municipality. But all of this is by complaint driven. So if your neighbors don't complain, the land use officers aren't gonna come and mess with you. Uh, um, so making friends with your neighbors is really important um, and keeping that, that good neighborhood. But it's also just good policy right now when people are, uh, are always busy bodies. Uh, uh, they wanna uh, be pecking around in uh, places where it's just your chickens, ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, so keep your chickens out of sight. Uh, keep, uh, uh, make friends with your neighbors. Uh, and generally, it's not gonna be a problem. The other thing you have to look to while though, is if you're in an area that has uh, uh, a local neighborhood covenant, like housing developments often have a neighborhood covenant that can say um, whether you can cut down a, a tree that's shading your garden or in our keep chickens. And these things are just more restrictive. So you might have to, to mess with that as well. Um, so, and finally, I just wanna say that there's a number of places online you can go to and start chats. One of them is the Halifax Chickens Facebook page, which is displayed there. Um, and um, I also invite you to go to the Facebook page, Food Security in the Bay which Transition Bay has recently started, and we can have discussions there. 
on this and all sorts of other food security issues. And a local good place in the St. Margaret's Bay for the, the feed and supplies is Redmond's Home Hardware. They're most excellent. So if you have problems accessing this later on, uh, get back to me. Um, and if you, I will answer it if you just uh, e email the Transition Bay uh, email, which is info at transitionbay.ca. Thank you. That's great, David. I've got a question, uh, if I could jump in. Um, this is chickens. Although I noticed in the opening letter that you showed the subject line, it said laying hens and chickens. I'm not sure if there's some regulatory <laughs> difference. There. Oh, well, yeah. right. So they, they uh, good question. So stop showing your this, screen, David, if you can, so we can see you. <laughs> okay. Um, so what they plan to do is to have, um, Oh, let's see, where is it going to go to? Um, anyway, so it, it's going to allow you to have turkeys and uh, ducks, um, guinea fowl, uh, quail, any laying hen is, uh -huh. is going to be okay. allowed within. But they didn't specify the numbers of those other animals or anything like that. So there's, uh, there's still a lot that they can do with this. So well, a laying hen could be any kind of fowl then. Yeah, yes, exactly. Okay. But it also excludes roosters, of course, just the hens. Yeah. But if you're in a mixed use area, then you can have a larger flock and uh, these, these rules presumably wouldn't apply to you in, in, the, in the, the mixed use or the, or the resource or farming areas. Okay. But it doesn't apply to, it just doesn't include goats or sheep or anything else. Um, and even bees are in a kind of a murky area. A lot of people are doing bees and, and it's just, if, you know, do it until someone stops you. And, and it's becoming very popular. People want this. So uh, I think it, we probably can get it even more loose over time because of COVID and other issues. But it's an ongoing political thing that, uh, my son John and I have been very involved with, as well as a, a lot of others. So we regularly lobby the mayor and other people. Thanks. We thank you. The um, the Halifax Honey Bee Association is also doing a lot of lobbying for honey bees in the city, and they I haven't followed all their stuff. I'm I'm involved with them a little bit, but um, they're a good resource for people, and um, and they are lobbying as well, David, for like for yes acceptance of bees and stuff and where they can be in urban areas and things. So stuff's changing. It just takes time. <laughs> yes, but it's really up to us. I, I think um, Victory Gardens, Climate Victory Gardens, COVID Victory Gardens, it's a big thing. It's a lot of discussion about it. And we're out right on the head of it. And during World War II, they would have posters telling people how, uh, that um, have your kids raise chickens in the backyards. Yeah. It's your patriotic uh, duty. Yeah. Um, uh, and it included other barnyard animals and all sorts of things. And I think it's time we, we really include all of this in, within the home gardening as well. Absolutely. Well, we're looking forward to next year's senior Saturday and, and Bob is going to do his Climate Victory Garden <laughs> presentation. And I think it's even gonna be more fitting. Yeah. So yeah, in that regard, for everybody that's online um, or on Facebook, in two weeks from today, at this time, we're going to be doing another workshop on climate victory gardening. So it'll be myself presenting and then another woman, Erin Clements. Uh, she lives in Clayton Park and she converted a very good portion of her front yard into a garden. And that generated a whole lot of questions from neighbors, people walking by, oh, cool, how do you do that kind of stuff? Wonderful. And even now with COVID coming along, she's kind of become the rage in the neighborhood because she's got a big garden in her front yard. So Great. I will be talking about <laughs> that. So Karen, you put together a resource guide for chickens. I, and, I, think, it's, I think it's up, if I'm not mistaken. Is Mel still it, around? 
it's on it's in the chat box right now for those that are on zoom um, and Mel can you post that on Facebook as well yep absolutely okay that's great okay. and and David you're gonna put the um, that HRM you uh, I'll put the links there? I'll put the links to all of those things okay yeah, absolutely and help guide anyone through it but you should almost just assume you're not allowed um, in Halifax to do anything <laughs> and just do it anyway, my, do my it opinion. Anyway. So the just, <laughs> the just do it anyway, because that does that hold as well for goats and sheep and? Yes. Just do it sure anyway. Does. <laughs> sure does. I'm getting a, a message from Natalie that she can't find the resource in the chat. It's, it's up. Okay. It says it's from Mel Mulroney to everyone. If you scroll up, Natalie, you should be able to find it in the chat box and you can click it to download. Hmm. So traditionally, we used to have rabbits being uh, one of the main things that homesteaders would do as well because both chickens and rabbits eat a lot of leftovers. Um, and they eat slightly different leftovers. And, and they're the most productive ways of getting uh, fast uh, food that particularly uses a lot of, of people leftovers. So that's something my, people my should consider. One, I think the number one animal though is, is, is a pig. We, we, my husband's from the Middle East, so I, we can't have pigs. But when I was growing up, we used to get the pig in the spring and we used to kill it in the fall. And it, was, it ate all of our scraps, they ate everything you gave it. And it was huge by the time we killed it. So you, a, a massive amount of meat for the a relatively short period of time of feeding. Um, and very easy to keep as well. So pigs are really, you know, much easier even than goats and sheep. Great idea. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And the and all these make great manure for, for gardening. If you have these animals, yeah. then you almost don't need any more manure. A lot of us here in St. Margaret's Bay, if we're not buying it from the store for a fertilizer, we're buying it from a local person who has horses for people who keep it for recreational horseback riding. Well, what if that's no longer available? If you have your own animals, pigs, chickens, goats, then you have a wonderful source of that concentrated manure that you really need for, for backyard composting or yeah. backyard gardening. Yeah. And I know that chicken manure in particular is one of the highest manures in nitrogen, which is one of the hardest things to get into good uh, gardens. It is, but you also need to let it sit for about uh, at least a year. Because one year we, Karen comes from a long line of potato farmers so we didn't know a lot about potatoes and we uh we thought we had amazing tomatoes because i mean potatoes because we had so much green well we didn't have any fruit <laughs> yeah it was all nitrogen yeah. yeah we had all stocks all leaves <laughs> yeah make sure it's well composted yeah yeah well, good I'd advice on that too that I'll I'll let, let there's a number of different ways to you know a number of different approaches to that and i know that i'm uh, experimenting more and more with that that you know part of it is just what what are you growing and then uh, you know for me I haven't uh, had enough space uh, as of late to be uh, composting my manure so uh, last year for instance I took all this fresh manure and just put it at the uh, as the base for raised beds yeah, yeah. And basically the plants were able to you know make their decision about how they were gonna drill down into it and use that compost and, um, you know, we had a garden that was just absolutely prolific, uh, which is kind of unusual, especially for like a first year garden. Um, but, uh, you know, we also have done, experimented with uh, making sort of compost teas with the manure. So we're kind of lowering that nitrogen and, and um, uh, diluting it a little bit and then pouring the water over beds where you might not want just kind of like, just, uh, you know, chicken manure right at the top on your greens, but yeah. pouring that wastewater, um, that manure water uh, tea over things is not so uh, uh, worrisome. So anyway, I'd encourage people to experiment. But yeah, I mean, if you could let it sit, that's, that's ideal, for sure. 
we can we've also put it when it's fairly fresh in between rows like sheet composting in between rows and then as it rains like the row might be a little raised with the, and then the compost is in the sides and as it rains the stuff gets washed down sort of more into the root zone and one year we made a victoria hot box victorian hot box we dug down oh, yes. put a bunch mm -hmm. of pot manure put some soil put a cold frame over it wow we we were growing greens for ages it was great so it, it, it there's kind of some good stuff you can do with hot stuff too <laughs> I, I've it's got so a question um, in terms of pest control in the garden. Every once in a while, there's a year, there's a particularly kind of cool, wet spring, and you get a huge blossom of slugs, and they're on everything, mm -hmm. and you're trying to figure out how to control them. Are chickens a way to control slugs if you turn them loose in the garden for a few hours once in a while? They probably would scratch yeah. and dig a lot of your stuff up if um, stuff was well established yeah ducks yeah. are amazing we're thinking about getting some ducks ducks eat a lot of slugs yeah they love slugs okay so but they, they won't trash the garden they'll just they not, no they yeah. will not trash the garden with those wet feet they don't dig the trouble with chickens is they dig and scratch ah uh -huh, okay it makes them great for digging up areas that are really weedy it's perfect yeah. But um, unless your garden's really well established, you don't really want to let your chickens in there until everything's really grown. And then they're not going to get in, they're not going to scratch out big plants. But apparently ducks, they, they, they don't dig, so they're perfect. They just like to eat the bugs. And you think about your, your chickens possibly if, would eat g certain greens, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so we have to kind of, that's why they'll get penned up and we'll yeah. kind of keep them out of the garden. And yeah, they like lettuce too. But we're thinking about getting a trio of ducks, so. Have you had ducks before? Nope. Nope. Anybody have ducks? No. Charlotte, no ducks along the way? No. Uh, why, no. why are they well, so good, Cody? What's that? What, what, what makes you say that they're really good? Well, they're, they're very good. Well, they're very social, but they're incredible. Um, they'll eat insects like slugs. So they'll, more, if they'll follow you to a certain area. And they don't dig things up, so they're great at eating insects. So there's that generated a whole lot of. So we're looking at maybe Indian runner or khaki yeah, camel. So Ginny Blackmore, uh, right. Blackmore, who presented to the uh, gardening club about two months ago now, maybe. Uh, she keeps lots of different animals, and she's among the many who swear by having just a few ducks. Uh, and he said the chickens just really don't like slugs that much, but the ducks love it. And that's in addition to the other things that uh, Karen and Cloudy were mentioning. So ducks are your, your thing. Um, and if you're trying to get rid of ticks, it's guinea fowl. Yeah, guinea fowl, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they well, just, ticks, they, guinea fowl. They love ticks. Yeah. And, and they're very defensive and, and they'll run around. They're very noisy. They are. Uh, but they're uh, but they're really hardy and they, they work they, they live well here and charlotte some duck eggs i guess duck eggs are fabulous to bake with oh really yes How many do you get a year not very many right no they can lay up to 200 a year yeah they're they're pretty good layers yes oh wow, really <laughs> so you've got to get ducks and we'll get news <laughs> okay <laughs> love ducks i didn't know that i thought they laid i thought they had a couple of broods of five or ten no oh no, they lay. Wow. I think we started a duck thing here. <laughs> now, I, I got to relate. We're talking about fowl. My neighbor grows a lot of potatoes. Mark Russell, some of you yes. know him. Oh, yeah. And I grow potatoes, and you get Colorado potato beetles eventually. You're going to, you know, you're going to get them sooner or later. And I have to try to figure out how to control them. Well, he's got a lot of potatoes, and he says every morning a family of ringneck pheasants comes into the potato patch, wow. and they methodically go around and pick off all the potato beetles. Nice. He says it's perfect control. Yep. So yeah, I'm hoping I get a few pheasants show up around well, here. Yeah, send them over to your place. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing, Bob, because we have uh, pheasants all over the place over here. So I'm pretty yeah. hopeful now about having some luck with potatoes. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just have one comment to the person who's uh, doing uh, meat birds. Um, 
I, when we got into meat birds, um, we go to Kagamagana and we noticed last year um, when we went, um, they wanted us to book when we were gonna do our, our butchering. So they're incredibly busy. And a couple people really waited, um, you know, to kind of book the, the butchering late in the season and, and she was quite booked. So if you're getting into lay, uh, meat birds, um, you may want to find the butcher and actually, you know, give them lots of notice of when you would like to bring your birds. And we've kind of done nine weeks is what we've done. And, and it seems to work. Um, we don't tend to raise them longer than that. Um, so if you're thinking about meat birds, you better connect with some, who's going to do the slaughter if you're not going to do it on your own. Okay, so thank you. I was thinking about waiting a year because I've been getting a lot of advice that um, my first year on the property, I should just observe the property and build my soil and whatnot. But in terms of getting professional butchering, is it expensive? What do you pay per bird? Usually $4.50 a bird. Okay. All right. Thank you. And we found it quite reasonable. And they're good. Um, and, they're good. And, uh, and, and how big does your bird dress out at it when it's nine weeks? Five to seven pounds. We've had a couple eight pounders. Yeah. And we've, we've gone a bit longer and had much big, they look like small turkeys, but they were going off their feet and we were having some, some problems. So we've cut it back nine, 10 weeks. That seems to be really optimum for us. And um, we have one chicken breast feeds both of us, no problem. They're, they're like the size of my hand, they're huge. Yeah, now yeah. another question, I'm just curious. You said, I think a bag of feed is $17 or something like that. How much feed, what's the cost of the feed to get to the end <laughs> for, for a chicken? I'm just curious. A meat bird eats a lot. Um, I don't know if we've ever figured out. Um, the cost. Probably four bags. No, I'm guessing. We usually get about 15 birds and I'm sure we go through at least probably six bags of feed. Yeah. I don't, like, they eat a lot. They eat, they eat tons. And, and they don't eat anything else. They don't eat treats. They, they, they don't seem to, they're, they're babies. I mean, they're still, they, they look big and they mature very quickly and they look like full grown adult birds, but they still have real baby mentalities. And um, you, we've given them other treats that the laying birds are like going crazy over and they just kind of stare at them like, what's this in the floor of my coop? They have no idea. And here, here's the nice thing about, you know, getting your, you know, raising your own. You can get everything back. So we, we get the hearts and the livers back. We get the feet back. Um, and, you know, the feet, uh, you can dehydrate for, uh, you know, for your dog, dog, for your dog, or you can make an incredible chicken stock from the feet, or you can, you know, eat the feet. I mean, that's quite a process. So we, we, we get everything back and, um, you know, we use it. And like I said, Karen's it, and the taste is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so six so bags of feed for how many chickens? 50 would be 15 meat birds. You think it's only six? We're, Bob, we're going to do the math this year. We'll, yeah, give we'll, you, we'll do the math. We'll, yeah. we'll, I'm just curious what the math is, what it costs feed wise to raise a meat yeah. bird. Yeah. 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 Could we're you just say 50 oh. or 15 birds? 15. We did 15. Yeah, one five. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question. Uh, is, 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 is there something slightly unethical or disgusting about the way that they've produced these meat birds to be so grotesquely fat in the breast that they can't move and they can't fly. It's a bit like M Margaret Atwood's book about the future of chickens. Is, it, is there any sense of, of, the, of the something weird about it for you guys or not? Um, no, I think we, we just know that they're susceptible to going off their feet. So we're really careful when we're raising them and we make sure that the conditions are optimal so that they stay really healthy. Um, if you if you don't want to raise a broiler like a broiler king or a breed specifically for meat birds there are a lot of dual purpose heritage birds that uh people raise which um we we got into the meat bird i did i i get very attached to animals <laughs> i did, i really resisted doing meat birds for a long time and in the end decided to go for it i don't want to start butchering um 
birds that I've, you know, had for months and months, like raising a heritage bird for, you know, for a long time until it's, you know, sort of an adult. And, and then you're going to, you know, decide whether well, we're keeping it for eggs or are we taking it for slaughter? I would rather go with the meat birds that they're, you know, they're in there. You give them a good life. It's like with your, your goats that you're going to eat. Um, that you're going to slaughter, um, you give them a good life, you know that you've had them in optimal conditions, they've had lots of sunshine and fresh air and great food, and then they're ethically done. And we don't keep them longer than their lifespan and health allows for. So we don't, we've had some problems in the very beginning, um, didn't really realize that you had to keep them moving or encourage them to move around and, you know, they've gone off their feet and stuff. So we're just really careful the way we raise them. And I don't have a problem with like these birds are specifically raised for meat and I don't have a problem with taking them to slaughter because I know that they can't live a long life. Like they're like, this is it. And my question is not so much if you care about taking them to slaughter, you're, you're giving them a wonderful life because you're obviously lovely, lovely people. Uh, but but, um, but they, the, the fact of their existence is humans mm -hmm. interference to, to, and you're looking at a deformed animal uh, because we've made them absolutely deformed. So it is still an element of, you know, you're, you're in a way by having them, are we supporting a system which is, which is gross? I th think I feel grosser about eating store-bought chicken and, yeah, for sure. you know, supporting, because that's yeah. that, the way they're raised is gross. Yeah. I, I don't feel that our birds are deformed or grotesque. I mean, well, it's, 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 it's like, the way they're genetically modified. Though. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I understand what you're saying. I and, get it. If you're if you're not comfortable with that, then stick with the heritage breeds and the dual purpose, like the big barred rocks, and you know they they make great meat birds as well. You just have to raise them to maturity first, and then decide you know who you're keeping for eggs and who you're taking for slaughter. Yeah. Um, I would get too attached to them, and they'd be all named by then, and then I wouldn't be able to eat any of them. And I'm not yeah. a vegetarian. I've, I've, I've heard commercially meat birds uh, they take them about six weeks. Yeah. They, so that's, the, that's the industry standard and that that's and i, I charlotte i kind of get where you're coming from because oh, me too because i i basically you know i would have no problem doing in a rooster um and if we had and if we raised um you know heritage breeds to be uh meat uh i would be fine with that but karen is real as you can see the way that she <laughs> raises her chickens um she is she becomes very attached and and uh so I'm not as attached, and it, it took me a long time to convince Karen. I said, Karen, like, we eat chicken. Why are we eating that chicken from Sobeys or from Costco? So maybe we're on a journey, Charlotte, and we'll keep you posted. <laughs> I, I remember. I How remember, does that sound? <laughs> I remember reading an article. I'm with you. <laughs> I, I remember reading an article in a rural delivery magazine probably a year and a half, two years ago. There was a couple on the South Shore somewhere. They brought over a heritage breed from France, I think it was. And it was this kind of mixed purpose. It, mm -hmm. would, lay, it would lay eggs, but not, that is, not as well as a laying hen. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were raising them mostly as a meat bird. They could be truly free range and actually run around. And they said the selling point was that they actually, when they dressed them out, tasted a lot more chickeny right. than, yeah. than a regular meat bird. <laughs> yeah. So no, no. the chickens have become the most uh, popular, most successful bird on the planet. Uh, there's never been a bird in which there were more birds than chickens, but yeah. they've done it by making this Faustian bargain with people that we make them really popular. They spread to more continents and there's more numbers and more varieties and they're in more habitats than any other bird ever. But yet they, for, for that, they offer their, uh, their eggs, their companionship and their bodies uh, to <laughs> us. And that's really similar in many ways to the way that uh, most First Nations, uh, our, our Aboriginal peoples around the world, See that there, you know, everything you eat, you ask permission, oh, including the plants or the animals, but you're you're all in a community, and then you ask them to come back again. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a spiritual connection, not so much what we eat. And we don't we can't live and go out and harvest in the woods anymore. 
are from the shoreline and move around, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that, that bird has flown <laughs> from mm -hmm. our ecology. But by doing these things really nicely with, with the chickens, we can really, uh, I think, make a real different connection. And I think it's, understand, I think it's important to be able to um, eat the birds as well and kill them. Um, and, but do it with that kind of a prayer, with, with that uh, uplifted attitude, because that's what makes the difference, I think, uh, how they're raised, how, how they're taken care of, how they're killed. Uh, and all of the animals that we eat, including the domestic chickens, have been bred so that they're no longer like the wild birds. So there's almost nothing that we eat now that hasn't been changed like that, including all of our plants. Yes, but there's a big difference between my chicken, a, a, a normal chickens and heritage chickens that fly up to their coops, that, that, that run around, that live in a totally natural life, and a chicken that can't move because its stress is so big that it falls over. It's completely, it's one, it's a, one, it's a big difference between the two, David. Sure, we've impacted everything. We've impacted and both. A big, and, like a, and a big difference between the, 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 the chicken in, in the, uh, the jungles of Southeast Asia uh, where they're not actually doing that well, um, but uh, they have a different kind of flocks and things like that. I have a comment on that too. Just so a few years ago, I was doing a, uh, my, my impression has always been the same that uh, meat birds I found kind of disturbing as far as um, what I had heard about them, uh, you know, not being able to walk after a certain weight and whatnot. Um, uh, a few years ago, I did a, uh, I work in television and I, um, wrote and directed a, a series on uh, local and uh, urban farming and local and sustainable farming in general. And we did an episode on chickens and um, uh, I was out at a farm with people raising meat kings, um, this common meat bird, um, and uh, not a factory farm setting, but someone uh, doing it and employing a lot of the things that, uh, that Karen, you talked about as far as, you know, making sure these birds were moving around a lot and so these birds were outside, they were moving. And uh, this, uh, this young woman that ran this farm said that she basically just, she had, she had uh, this, there would be a rare instance that a bird might have some kind of an issue, but basically they were getting enough exercise that they were not having this issue of falling over. And so that's, that's one notion that when they're actually, we've, we have kind of this dual issue that you have this uh, bird that is, um, you know, has these genetic predilections to just yeah. get so big um, to be harmful. But then you also have a circumstance where they're being raised where they can't even move. So a lot of the stories about their legs are about situations where they're not uh, living naturally. But then, so that's one part of it. The other part is that uh, speaking with um, breeders over the years, my understanding is that the meat kings are not genetically modified as in like a test tube sort of a situation. They're, they're carefully bred. And so to create this similar meat king, it's like we're taking a uh, we're taking a whatever breed and a whatever breed, and then produce this one. And then the other side, we're taking this breed and this breed uh, that are, and then producing this one. And then we take those and we breed them together, and then that produces a meat king. And so they have this process that they're doing over and over and over again um, in order to get those meat king uh, babies. Um, so it's not. To me, that also plays into uh, uh, how much this is an oryx and crake situation, as you pointed out, um, whether it's, you know, uh, so mind-bendingly disturbing. Um, you know, it is mechanized and industrialized in that way, but uh, I found that much less uh, mm -hmm. horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen those birds live decent lives. Uh, anyway, that was just one comment on it all. I also had a question for you, Karen, about you were saying it was 450 to uh, have your birds um, slaughtered. Yep. Uh, what do you get back? That's like you deliver a whole bird and then you get back uh, what? Um, you can, you can, um, there's, 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 there are some varying costs. So every, every processing plant slaughterhouse is going to have different, you know, rates for things, but we generally, we bring the birds in and we say we would like this many birds as whole uh, broilers. And then we want like packages with breasts, legs, thighs, whatever. Um, they will, most, most of the processing places will vacuum seal or not. That's up to you. Um, 
we ask for the innards back and we ask for the feedback because we and make, the gizzards because we make dog food and all that kind of stuff. Yep. I will not eat a chicken leg, but I will happily give it to the dog. Um, so we um, or chicken foot rather. So we we actually just kind of detail how we want it broken down, and then there's a little extra charge for breaking it down. And I can't remember what the actual figures are, but it it in the grand scheme they they do a very good job. It's all packaged exactly the way you want it, and um, the conditions in in this particular place are very very good. And um, if there's a little extra charge. It's not a lot, and I, I haven't got the figures, but I, I don't recall it ever being, you know, kind of we bring in a bunch of birds, pay a bunch of, you know, pay the money. And it, I, I don't think we're saving a lot of money growing our own chickens. Um, you know, and people sort of, sort of like, oh, well, you must save a lot of money. It's like, no, probably not. But we have really good chicken, and I don't feel guilty eating it because I know how they lived. And the taste is absolutely out of this world. The Sobe's chicken has no flavor. The stuff in our freezer is just divine. It's 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 very flavorful. So worth it. Um, Karen and Claudia, what uh, you mentioned the cost of the feed and and to get the processing of the bird. What does it cost per chick when you purchase them? Oh, it's like a dollar twenty-five or something. Okay. Nothing. nothing. So it's that. Okay, so adding those three things together, then you're talking about uh, twelve uh, fifty-five per bird. If it's six bags of feed for fifteen. Oh, you're doing the math. Yes, I did the same. <laughs> the, the, the feed is twenty dollars a bag now. Yeah, and it and it's actually we, we get our feed we get our chicken feed um, at Scotian Gold because they actually mill their own down there in Brooklyn. So we, we get a, a, a you know, it, it's got a lot of different grains in it. Mm. So we've been, we've been going there. We have a friend who actually lives close by. So um, we haven't been buying kind of chicken pellets and stuff, right? Um, but like each, but each bird needs something different, right? Yeah. And the, the broilers have their own feed. The meat birds have their own, yeah. you know, mix of grains and stuff that you buy specifically for that type of bird. Do you guys know of any, is there anywhere that you can buy feed that it doesn't come in those plastic bags? Oh, no. Oh. Yeah, no. I, I mean- All I, the bags are plasticized, yeah. I think. Yeah. Which is, I, I, like, I'm incredibly, I'd love to buy, be able to buy feed differently myself. And I, I think of people, like I'm very fit. I can sling one of those bags around like, it's nobody's business. But I'm thinking like, one, they could be smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and they do, they have- Usable. And yes, and use and yes. You know, they won't accept them back at the co-op store. You used to go into the bag and say, you know, they're brilliant bags. They're really strong, yeah. and they're just they won't take them back. Let's start making shopping bags, girl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The bags. <laughs> there we go. I I, 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 I filled them with compost. Uh, Claudia, can we uh, maybe uh, coordinate next time you're getting feed from Brooklyn? Because I bring the feed to my son. Oh, so do you? If we could buy together, then uh, I could bring it up to him and it might be better quality. Assuming you would like that, son, but it sounds like a good deal. Well, we, we actually get it from a friend. And so we'll have to see if she can transport. But but I will share some with you so you can see what it is. Uh, we really like it. Yeah, um, it's a nice mix. And, and um, you know, yeah, I would okay. say the answer to it, like to get a complete bird um, slaughtered, like whole, and to bring the innards, the, like the gizzard, the heart, the liver, and the legs, and everything is, is four dollars and fifty cents. Now, when you start breaking it up, there's different costs. But we, like I said, we we get the whole, we get everything back. The feathers compost right. really I, well. Can you get I, that too? I, I did. I did promise. I did promise that we were going to wrap up at four thirty, um, and actually, we're going to need to be off in ten minutes because this channel is going to be opening up for a whole nother. Um, conversation with other people. <laughs> um, so I'd like to see if we could bring it to a close. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I would like to everybody if we could thank um, Claudie, Karen, and Charlotte for the fantastic presentation. Thank you. Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, you as well. Thank you for that background and, and John for the other information. I'd like to thank Natalie and Sebastian and everyone else that joined in for your keen interest. Um, I do want to uh, remind you, go to the 
um, our website, transitionbay.ca. You can sign up for newsletters, so you'll always be in the loop of all upcoming workshops like this into the future. Um, I see some thumbs up there in, in our participants list. That's fantastic. Um, and also feel free to make a donation on our website as well. We greatly appreciate that. It gives us an opportunity to do a whole lot more of this kind of stuff.